get the recording started. And I'm going to share my screen and start the talk. So I do try to keep this as informal as possible. It, it's a weird scenario not being face to face. Uh, but uh, with that being said, I do encourage everybody to ask questions and use the chat feature as we go through the talk. So if a question pops into your head, um, I minimize it while I'm talking. So feel free, type your question as you're thinking of it. Uh, and then in between each slide or at a good stopping point as we go through, I stop and answer any questions that have come up. And if I do gloss over your question or skip over it, it means it's probably going to be covered uh, at some point during the talk or it's super specific. If it's very, very specific to your garden and it doesn't really apply to everybody, I just like to, um, you know, everybody's time is valuable. So those kinds of questions I will hold till the end of class, but I always stay afterwards to answer those kinds of questions as well. So hopefully everybody gets, gets their info that they're looking for today. So um, just so you know the difference between the Q&A and the chat, um, it is a little bit easier to use the chat, but you can certainly use either. So feel free um, to use the chat feature or the Q&A. And today we are going to be doing a quick talk on garden pests, six garden pests, common garden pests here in Florida especially, and what we can do to stop them. So we're going to be covering small mammals, which I grouped together because there are a lot of similarities between them. Uh, but things like squirrels, raccoons, possums, and rats all fall into this category. We're also going to be discussing birds. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily think about them as being pests in the garden until they're chomping on your tomatoes or your berries. <laughs> uh, we also are going to cover iguanas, which are not necessarily everywhere in Florida, and I know that I generally teach the whole state, uh, but it is a significant um, pest issue down in some parts of Central, but mostly South Florida. We're going to cover leaf miners aphids and cutworms for insects. Uh, I liked to include leaf miners and aphids because they are super prevalent and common here in Florida across the board um, and also the cutworms especially right now because when we're all putting in our fall crops and our seedlings they are very susceptible to cutworms so that will be a very timely discussion I believe. I always like to start my talks with a quick um, Quote. So today we're going to start with the famous balance of nature is the most extraordinary of all cybernetic systems. Left to itself, it is always self-regulated. And cybernetic is basically just a, a study of regulatory systems. And basically what this is saying is when left undisturbed, nature is really really good at self-regulating and balancing itself. And that may seem like an interesting quote to start a pest management uh, talk with, but I also like to emphasize the fact that today we will not be discussing any sort of pesticides to use. Uh, if you're familiar with me and the topics that I cover and the approach that I use, I use a very um, to typically organic, very sustainable approach to things. And I try very hard to work with nature. So all of the solutions that we're gonna be discussing today do not use pesticides. Uh, they are all natural solutions or homemade solutions that you can implement to deter, uh, repel, and eliminate pests. So the approach that I use in my garden and that I help people implement in theirs is an integrative pest management technique. And I know that's a big wordy uh, title, but that's the scientific term for it. My training is actually, I, I think I might have accidentally slipped over that slide. Uh, if we're not familiar, if you haven't, we haven't gotten the, to meet, my background is in wildlife ecology and conservation with a minor in zoology. So I kind of have that science background and I actually took an entire course on um, insects and we were talking about the integrative pest management approach and basically what that means is it's a process that solves pest problems but doing it in a way that minimizes risks to people in the environment so it's taking in instead of that single snapshot it's looking at the big picture 
and trying to do things to set yourself up for success from the get-go rather than just constant problem problem shooting um, kind of that offense versus defense approach to things so uh, integrative pest management would be very much an offensive approach to gardening so it starts with this um, general uh, flow chart that you see here, inspecting your plants, identifying if there is a problem, um, continual monitoring, and then um, hopefully the systems are in place that they self-regulate, just like that quote. Um, but sometimes some action is required or or can be necessary on your part if you choose. And that's where we're gonna be focusing our talk today is in this action section of IPM, Integrative Pest Management. Uh, so we're gonna be talking, on, uh, talking about active solutions that you can implement in your garden. And we are going to dive right in, but I did want to um, hop over and just see if there are any questions so far. Uh, remember, you can always use the chat or the Q&A um, feature to um, ask any questions you may have. So let me see here. Sometimes the chat can be a little difficult to pull up. If anybody, you know what, we're just going to hop over and do the question and answer instead of the chat. Uh, so if anybody typed a question into the chat feature, uh, go ahead and answer it or ask it in the question and answer. That way I can pull it up. It's in a different box for me, so it's a little bit easier. All right, so um, small mammals. Right. Uh, our talk is going to be uh, specifically squirrels, possums, raccoons, and rats. And each slide we're going to have um, some examples of different techniques you can implement. Some of them are um, simply deterrents, some of them are removing them, some of them are preventing them from getting to the garden, it all depends. But all of them can be useful in keeping these pests from getting your valuable produce that you've worked so hard and so, so diligently to grow. So with the small uh, mammals, especially with um, possums in particular, they uh, will often burrow um, under sheds, houses, if you're uh, a raised house, if you have like a crawl space house, uh, they will um, into the bushes, uh, near trees, they'll dig a burrow and they will be there during the day and come out at night. Um, so an easy way to prevent this from occurring, basically removing their, their home without trapping them inside, is to stuff something in it that they can move. Um, and so newspaper, um, like a balled up burlap sack if you have those around, um, anything like that, if you stuff that in the burrow where you know they're coming in and out of, and pack it real good so they can't get around it, uh, when they come out at night, you'll see that that is moved. So you know they are no longer in there and you can go ahead and completely block that off, whether it be with hardware cloth, if it's you know the perimeter of your house, if it's um, cinder blocks, bricks from around the home, whatever you have that will permanently block that space where they're burrowing. And why you would bother with stuffing it first is because obviously we're, we're not looking to uh, harm them. And you certainly wouldn't want them to just starve under there um, and create a rotten, stinky mess. Um, that's, I don't think, anybody's ideal version of fixing this problem. So by putting in an indicator that they are out of their home, that gives you the signal that you can go in at night after, after sunset to block off their re-entry to their home. So that can be helpful. And then they'll hopefully move on to a different uh, location especially if you already have the rest of the area um, well, well secured. Uh, another one that I always like to mention with the mammals especially, uh, it's also helpful with deer, uh, not that this is the main focus of the talk, but malorganite is actually a product that's been created by the University of Wisconsin, and it is composted human manure. It sounds a little freaky to a lot of people, but it has been university studied. It is FDA approved, um, or um, not, I'm sorry, not FDA. We're not consuming it, but uh, USDA approved. 
Um, so this is technically labeled as a fertilizer. Um, that's what it's certified for. It is also not certified as a uh, pesticide uh, because any sort of repellents or anything like that have to be registered as a pesticide. And that is a lot of extra work on their part. Um, so their primary focus was as a fertilizer, but it does have the smell light smell, uh, undetectable by me. I've used it before um, by us, but it is detectable by them. That smell of us does deter them from the area. So it's kind of like an added bonus. You get a fertilizer and a pest deterrent uh, all in one. So you can do, if you have raised beds or containers, you can put them around the base of the containers or the beds around the edges, and that will deter uh, the rodents and mammals from getting into your garden. There has been some, there are some people that say companion planting can help with them. I personally have not found this super helpful or effective, but uh, I think companion planting does have a place in the garden overall. So I did mention it. Um, different herbs are very aromatic. Uh, things like mustards and real spicy plants uh, can also technically have a deterrent property to them. Uh, alliums, anything in the onion family, garlic, will all potentially deter the pests from the garden. With that being said, I have found um, a hot pepper spray and I'll have the recipe at the very end of today's talk for this, but it's a homemade spray that I made. You can purchase it. It's very easy to make, um, just turn stuff around the home. And if you spray that onto, especially um, valuable produce, like we see here a bunch of pictures of tomatoes with the mammals. Uh, if you spray that with this hot pepper spray, it is pretty repugnant to them. Uh, it's garlic and pepper and a soap mixture to help it stick and that will definitely deter them from eating them. I mean, you might lose one or two until they figure out what's going on and then they'll leave the area or that plant. So this can be a very effective way of doing it. It does have the downfall that it is, you may lose a few in the beginning until they figure it out. You'll also have to reapply after rains or if you're top watering uh, heavily, you would have to reapply after watering. So it's, it's a, a time consuming way, but it is effective. Uh, you can also cover, this is more specifically for squirrels, it seems, in my opinion, I've noticed um, sometimes rats, but digging in the garden, especially right now in fall, we have all of these fresh new young seedlings and they are planting acorns. <laughs> so uh, you'll constantly see them digging in the garden. So covering your seedlings and kind of surrounding them either with sticks, um, overturned cups that have the, the top cut out so that they can still breathe, uh, the clear ones, of course, so they still get light as well. Um, doing a floating row cover or some sort of way to keep them from constantly digging in the soil and disrupting your new seedlings and transplants uh, can be helpful because uh, luckily that's usually a more of the beginning of the season type issue that you'll have with the mammals and not a continual thing. You can also definitely want to remove any alternative food sources. Uh, so we had a question uh, from someone who's attending today and they asked about uh, compost buckets um, that they have actually inside their garden beds. Uh, it's a super, you may have seen like Subpod is like the glorified version of this. Uh, it sounds like she has a homemade, he uh, has a homemade version of this, which is great. Uh, they are very effective. You can have the worms in there with the uh, compost and it basically is like a free flowing environment, but you're putting raw food scraps directly into a bucket and raccoons especially are incredibly intelligent critters. Um, so they can very easily manipulate lids and stuff like that. If you have buckets that have just the pry on and off lids, uh, those are much easier for them to open. You can get the ones that have the twist locks. So the ones that you have to like press a button and turn, those um, I have seen to be more effective at keeping critters out of the containers. You could also potentially switch over to something that has some sort of latching system 
and um, use, use a latch system. And that would also work to keep them out. But removing alternative food sources, compost being a really primary one, but also um, cat food. If you have uh, outdoor cats in the area, that can be a big attractant for raccoons, possums, and rats. Um, so uh, to, just figuring out a way to keep that either indoors at night or um, starting to feed inside only and then letting the cats out during the day, whatever works for you guys, but removing those alternative food sources because typically in most gardens, they're not gonna find enough to support themselves constantly just off your garden. So if you're removing those other food sources and they don't have other things to browse and go through, uh, they'll probably move on to find uh, uh, better feeding grounds, I guess you could put it. So, all right. We will, let's see. Um, so Deborah asked uh, for rabbits. Uh, some of those techniques will work for rabbits as well. Uh, let's, so the Melorganite isn't as effective with them. The hot pepper spray is absolutely going to work with them. Uh, they, and, and they're gonna have other food sources. There's no way we can remove all of their food sources. Um, you can, if you find a burrow, you can use the, the block the home technique. Uh, they do burrow if you can find their home. Um, companion planning is not gonna work. With rabbits though, it's if you know that's what you're dealing with, a really effective way to keep them out of the garden, which is absolutely silly because they can jump, but a very low bordered fence, you know, like those one to two foot, just enough to give you height. Um, for whatever reason, they just, they won't go over it. Uh, so those are usually really effective at keeping them out of the garden, especially if you're already working with containers or raised beds where you already have a little bit of elevation to it, that usually is enough to keep them out. Um, so that is definitely something that's quite effective with rabbits. All right, so for the birds. Birds are an interesting one because nine times out of 10, they're actually very helpful to have around the garden. They will constantly peruse looking for insects and different critters that are crawling around in the garden that may not be helpful. Uh, they will literally pick caterpillars off. Uh, they will go through and eat all sorts of bugs. So grubs, all that kind of thing. But of course you don't want them. I literally, I couldn't find, I was going back through my, my um, phone to try to find the video. I have a video where I was standing in my kitchen and I was, I, I knew the birds were eating it, but I hadn't caught them at it yet. My tomatoes, I'd come out and there'd always be all these holes and everything like you see in this picture. And I, I caught one and he just, he hung out there and he took half the tomato and then he hopped to enough, another plant and started eating those tomatoes. So even though they're helpful most of the time, if you're not willing to share, here are some solutions. And I use this very sparingly, like I said, because most of the time they're doing us a favor by being in the uh, environment. And especially with things, maybe your blueberry bushes or your strawberries, you don't have quite enough to go around, but if you have indeterminate tomatoes or something like that producing, you usually have more than you could possibly know what to do with, uh, especially if you have a couple of plants. I chose not to do anything about them in the eating the tomatoes in the garden. I had plenty of other pests that I was more than happy for them to, to eat. So I didn't even do any of these techniques to keep them out, but I do understand your frustration. And when it came to blueberries, which is that top picture, I did opt to use netting to cover the uh, blueberry bushes just during season. Uh, so I have there the butterfly netting. You'd think you'd use the bird netting. It's actually a larger mesh and they're, it, they can get entangled in it much easier. It's really important, really, really important if you're using the netting to make sure that it is very firmly planted along the entire edge so that animals aren't trying to get in and that they don't get stuck. Um, and sometimes also putting uh, tape, like the sparkle tape or whatever that hangs and flutters in the wind will kind of alert them that there's something there so that they don't try to get in 
and get themselves trapped because that is a very negative um, impact that the netting can have. Some of the other ones though are very time consuming to do, which is why a lot of people will opt for netting. Uh, you can use decoys and scare tactics, but they need, to, the birds are not dumb. Uh, so they need to be moved very regularly. They need to be changed out. Things like scarecrows, you literally have to move around the garden, um, change the clothes. If you're using any of the CDs hanging in the trees, those need to be taken down and then put back out, um, you know, a few weeks to a month later. So those can work. They're very effective, but they are very short-term temporary solutions to keeping the birds distracted and confused. You can use a hot pepper spray. Birds' sense of taste is not the same as mammals, so they're not going to be as sensitive to it, but it can help. Um, you can also protect um, the younger plants um, or the fruiting plants in particular, so you can let it go through most of its life stage with no care, and then once it is fruiting and you're noticing it, you can do things like bag your produce. Uh, so depending on what it is, you can purchase little bags um, and cover each individual fruit. Again, I did not say this was a uh, time, time uh, appropriate thing to do, but if you have uh, some valuable crop to you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, say only one or two blueberry, blueberry bushes or, um, you know, some mangoes or whatever the case may be and you really want to protect them, it might be worth the effort. Uh, you can also, and most things you wanna say, eliminate the alternative food sources, but we are not going to be able to keep birds out of our garden. They are everywhere in our environments, and it is not, they are so mobile that there is zero chance of us removing food sources and removing them from the area. So in this case, offering an alternative food source Ideally, not near the garden it can be a good solution, say a bird feeder in the backyard if your garden's in the front or vice versa. Um, that gives them an easy food supply that a lot of times will keep them satisfied, especially when that is a constant and the garden is, the garden produce is infrequent. So that can be a helpful tactic with birds. All right. So Laura asked about the hanging CDs or reflective surfaces deterring birds. Um, they ate all of my lovely grapes. Yeah, it is so frustrating. And, and like I mentioned, they, they are effective, but like we're talking a couple of days effective. So those are kind of a tool in addition to, especially like right around ripening time could be a helpful tool. Um, also, they have things like if you really, really want to get into it, the uh, especially with like grapes or high value crops that we only get a little bit of. They have like water squirters and de um, detectors, movement de motion detectors that you can implement. Um, so those are all potential solutions, but it can be very time consuming to keep up. All right, so our third one is going to be iguanas. And this doesn't necessarily apply to most of the state, but the, those it does apply to, these are the absolute number one most infuriating um, pest that they deal with, it, from my experience talking to folks um, across the, co the country, across the state now. Uh, the iguanas, a lot of the other pests might get a fruit, they might you know, disturb a seedling or two. Iguanas will devour the entire garden. <laughs> which clearly is not acceptable to us gardeners trying to grow food. So they can be very difficult to eradicate. We can make it less favorable in our environment for them. Uh, the FWC put out some pointers down uh, in the Miami Gate area that give you some suggestions like collaring your trees. They like to climb. So if you go about two feet above the grounds and put a metal collar around the tree, it prevents them from climbing up the tree. They don't have that uh, comfortable habitat for themselves. They also like areas where they can sun, like rocks and that kind of thing. So if those are something that you can easily remove from the environment, say if you have you know, those like rock borders along a, a planter or something, that could help. Um, so the less happy they are in the environment, the more likely they are to choose somewhere else. Decoys and scare tactics can work for them, 
Again, very time consuming uh, and more of a temporary solution. The hot pepper spray is effective with them though. So you can use the spray recipe that I'm gonna share at the end of the talk to use for the iguanas. Uh, in this case, we're also trying to remove other food sources. So uh, they love things like hibiscus flowers and that kind of thing. So um, transitioning to less, less appetizing uh, landscaping around your garden can be helpful uh, just because it's that much less for them to have to munch on. And it, the only 100% effective way, unfortunately, is to gauge them. And netting isn't usually even going to cut the, it's not even gonna cut it. You need to cage it with uh, hardware cloth or potentially chicken wire. If you use chicken wire, know that the small ones will still get in. Uh, so if you wanna be 100% throw, it's probably gonna be hardware cloth. And that can be a rather costly endeavor but it is incredibly effective at keeping them out of your garden. All right. So if we, anybody has any questions as we're going along, do feel free to use the uh, uh, Q&A feature. But now we are going to move into, oh, uh, let's see if the chat will pull up. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I can get that chat to pull up. All right, whoever just typed a question in chat, I saw it flash, but when I'm in talker or speaker mode, it sometimes is, gives me problems. So just type in the Q&A and I'll get to it. All right, so leaf miners, especially right now, we're all planting our tomatoes and we have a lot of people had some leaf miner problems with their citrus over the summer. Um, leaf miners are super common here and it's not just one pest that we're dealing with. It's any number of moths that are laying their larvae, um, go through the pupae stage in there. And they're, basically what it is, is these teensy tiny little insects that are in between the layers of the leaves. And they leave these little tunnels as they chew through the leaves. I, luckily this is one. There are a few things we can do to eradicate it but it's pretty much a visual thing, uh, an aesthetics thing. In most cases, it, it's not going to affect the plant. I have yet to see it kill or reduce yields on a plant. The young tender growth, especially at the beginning of the season, they're susceptible to the leaf miners, um, but I have yet to actually see it take a plant out. So that's a plus even though a lot of people experience them, they're not going to really damage your final product. So that's good. Um, what you can do to prevent them is to maintain plant health. It all starts with the soil. And this goes for any insect or fungal issue. If we maintain plant health, the Help, when we're healthy, just like, you know, if we are overworked and haven't been sleeping well and have been eating crappy fast food and whatever, we're way more likely to get sick. So the plants are the same way. If they're planted out of season, if they don't have enough nutrients or water or they're some way in other ways stressed, they are much more likely to succumb to pest and fungal pressure. So Having, uh, having them be happy and healthy from the get-go by you know, amending your soil, using compost, putting in whatever amendments they need, um, keeping them on a regular watering schedule, planting them in the correct seasons can really go a long way for all three of these garden pests that we're gonna be talking about, the insect pests, to helping them fight off uh, attacks. So if you notice one or two leaves that are affected by leaf miners, you can simply just pinch that leaf off and that will have the larvae in it and you can dispose of that. Just know that unless you're literally doing like say floating row covers, it, it is quite likely that another moth or whatever um, critter is laying is going to find it again. So it's not something that you get rid of once and it's just gone. So it's gonna be a continual thing because they're in our environment and that just is it, it is what it is. So you can pick the leaves off um, if you like. You can also use sticky traps. This will trap the adult uh, form of it. So if you have them hanging on or near the plants that you know are super susceptible to it, uh, tomatoes being one of it, 
typically not so much on the leafy greens, especially things like in the uh, brassica family. Um, those aren't super susceptible to them. Um, but if you hang the sticky traps near it, it will trap the adult form when they're coming into lay. So that can be an effective technique um, to pre prevent them from ever being laid into the leaf. You can do floating row covers. The young tender leaves are more sensitive, new growth, that kind of thing. So if you're in that season or you want to temporarily have a floating row cover over your bed or your containers, that can keep out these and other pests like squash vine borers and all sorts of other things. So as long as they're timed appropriately, uh, this can be an effective management technique. I also suggest encouraging beneficial insects in your garden. This is a key component of the IPM, the integrated pest management we were talking about earlier. And I do have a full video on another free class I had offered. I put it up on YouTube, so I will send that entire video out to you all at the end of the class with the recording uh, if you want to learn more about that technique in specifically. But encouraging beneficial insects like parasitic wasps or lacewings um, or ladybugs, praying mantis, um, pirate bugs, uh, wheel bugs, all of these are uh, predators of other insects. And so when we encourage them to be in our environment, we are less likely to experience heavy pest pressure on our vegetable crops. So that can be a wonderful technique to implement. So we have a few questions I'll hop over. Uh, do the homemade sprays for leaf miners help? That's a great question. No, not, they're very, very minimally effective and it would be on the adults, not the uh, leaf miners themselves, which are the, the larvae in between the leaf layers um, because they're already in there. So by the time we see them and would think or know to spot treat, uh, they're already inside and it's not, spray treatments are not very effective with leaf miners. So that one unfortunately is eh, not, not so helpful. Um, Lori asked what floating row covers are. So floating row covers, you can buy kits, you can make them yourself, but basically what happens is if you have a raised bed or a larger container, it's not super easy to do on a single container. You could probably put like some bamboo stakes in the corner of the container and drape the material, but the material is a very, very thin, um, like gauzy almost material, and it will prevent any flying insects or anything like that from getting into your crops. So we'll keep the moths out. It'll keep anything that's laying the caterpillars or the leaf miners or um, any of that stuff from getting into the garden beds. But it also excludes pollinators. Um, so if you were to keep it on too long, once your, you know, your crop is blooming or whatever, it will prevent the, the pollinator species from getting in. So what typically happens with row covers is you'll apply it at the beginning of the season when the uh, plants are very young and immature and attractive to those pests and susceptible to them. So you'll cover them then and then as soon as you start getting your blooms, you would remove the row cover. Um, and the material is also uh, lets light through, which is very important. Uh, so that is, a, it's not, a, it doesn't have to be super expensive, especially if you don't buy the kits, if you kind of do it with PVC on your own and just pay for the, the material. It's not terribly expensive, but you know, it's one more thing to store. It's, it's just depends on whether you'd like to implement it or not, really. All right. Um, so Kat has uh, a quick question, asked what part of Florida I am. I'm in St. Pete, Tampa Bay area. So Central Florida, zone 9B, 10A is my growing zone. All right. What type of uh, praying insects do you introduce to the garden? Uh, in most cases, I don't do introductions unless there is like an extreme problem going on in the garden. Uh, or if a system or a client's garden that I'm working with is not very well established, if they're just getting started, say it's their first season or two, and they don't have very many um, flowers around to keep the beneficial insects in the area, or for whatever reason that, that, that component of keeping them in the area isn't quite there yet. But with that being said, 
I've never released ladybugs in my garden and I have boatloads of them whenever my aphids are around. So they will naturally come and find your garden because it's a food source and that's what they're doing. They're constantly patrolling. They're already in our environment. Um, so they will find your garden. It's just, honestly, it's usually not quick enough for our own liking. <laughs> So we get impatient and we want quicker results, so we purchase. And there's nothing wrong with purchasing the, um, like from Arbico or Organics. And, you know, there are been, you can absolutely release them in the garden. It just can be an added expense because, you know, you pay $10, 15 $20, depending on the type of insect. And a lot of times they're going to leave if they don't have enough of a support system in place to give them alternative food sources, if they don't have a home environment. So... It's a catch-22, um, but you can absolutely release them in large quantities. All right. Um, so Deborah asked about deterring spiders um, from a screened porch. Honestly, spiders are beneficial. They're eating a lot of the other insects that we don't want around, um, and they're usually not going to bother you. But I get that it can. It's a you know a, a, not a not a friendly site for some folks. So if you really need to deter them, honestly, just moving them is the easiest solution and making sure they're not um, laying eggs in there. But as far as deterring them, just making sure your screens are well sealed, but they're gonna find their way in. It's kind of one of those inevitable things. Um, so just, I think, uh, you know, finding a stick and removing them outside is probably your best bet. All right. So we are going to move on now to aphids. And uh, let's see here. My chat finally popped up for some reason. I think there might've been a few questions that didn't get answered in the other one. Leaf miners have sunburst type damage. Can't use those leaves, 80% of the leaves. I have to pick them. Okay, so um, she uh, Genoi has a, uh, basil plant that is uh, heavily covered in leaf miners and that is with with leaves where we're harvesting that and we're not looking just for the fruit it can be frustrating so uh, to do that you can do the floating row cover method uh, would probably be the most effective and just keeping them under that so that the plant especially with that you're not looking for any sort of pollination or anything so pruning the bush back to a point where you have no more of them in there and then keeping the floating row cover on there uh, will eliminate that and allow the, the basil to thrive. Uh, but also the, the parasitic uh, insects and beneficial insects can also help with that problem. All right, aphids, another super duper 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 common. Everywhere, every garden in Florida is gonna get aphids. Uh, we, they are soft bodied insects. They come in on all different colors. You can see here, black, orange, green, brown. Uh, they are sucking the life out of your plants. They are sucking the juices and the nutrients and everything out of your plants. These will affect your plants and they are something that needs to be taken care of. There are just different approaches to taking care of it. So what the first step, a lot of people will very regularly fertilize their gardens. And when plants are super high in nitrogen, it actually attracts them. They, they love nitrogen and nutrient rich plants. So fertilizing, of course, is necessary or amending your soils is necessary for healthy plant growth. But overdoing it can just draw the aphids in even more than they would already be there. So that's why you typically see a lot of aphid pressure on things like beans, cow peas, beans, peas. Um, they're already high in nitrogen, which is why they're attracted to those ones. The most effective and a lot of times gets squeals from people is squashing them. Uh, so if you run your hands the length of the stem or on the back of the leaf, it will very easily squash them. You can do it with gloves if you're opposed to um, actually doing it with your, just your hands. It, that will work just fine too. Uh, so you can definitely very quickly and easily take care of a problem that way. You can alternatively hose them off, but this is only effective if you, you have like say one plant in the area. You can just kind of blast them off with a hose 
onto the ground. They won't have anything to eat. And as long as there aren't ants in the area to move them right back to the plants, um, that can be an effective treatment. But if you're in a densely planted garden or anything like that, it's not going to be very helpful because you're just going to move them from one to the other. Soapy water can be effective. I, I basically treat soapy water as a pesticide. That's what it is. Uh, it will kill on contact. So if you see aphids and you spray the soapy water directly onto the aphids, it will clog their pores, they cannot breathe, and they will die. So technically, even though it is not harmful for us, it's, um, it is a pesticide. So I guess my initial lead-in was not 100%. But um, I only use this if absolutely necessary. I really try to use all of the other techniques mentioned because it's much more targeted and if there's lace wings, for example, are very, very small. They're a beneficial insect, but they're very hard to see. Um, they have like teensy, tiny, clear wings and they're very small bodied. If they're in there feeding and we go and spray soapy water or whatnot, you know, we're killing the beneficials as well. If there's, you know, a ladybug larvae in there, those are gonna die. So I use that soapy water as a last resort. If you've had aphid problems, which if you've been gardening a while, I'm sure everybody has experienced, and you've noticed that there are always or almost always ants with the aphids. And that is a symbiotic relationship that they have. Um, it's a beneficial relationship that they've created. And what happens is the aphids are clearly not, uh, they, they do not have a good defense system in place. They're soft bodied, they're basically immobile. They, they are very easy prey. So the ants will protect them. They will defend them from beneficial predators that are in the area looking to eat the aphids. They will actually battle, which is pretty crazy. They will defend their ants because the ants are a food source for them. So uh, with them being a food source, they, the, the aphids excrete this like sugary substance. If, if you have a really bad aphid infestation, you'll usually see like the leaves start turning kind of like sooty black color. That's what they're excreting and the ants will eat that. So the aphids offer the ants a food source and in return, the ants will protect the aphids from predators in the area. So they have that relationship. So if you can distract or prevent the ants from protecting those aphids, because they, they will go so far as to like take them down below um, at night to protect them under the soil and move them back up the plant during the day. I mean, they, they take their jobs very seriously. So uh, to give them an alternative, um, sometimes I'll put a sugary water dish, like a little dish or tray at the base of the plants with a lot of sugar water in it. And that's an easier food source. So they will eat from there, which will open up the door for the beneficial insects to come in and eat the aphids and control them naturally. Uh, so that's one technique. You can also, if you're not dealing with them on a ton of plants, you can also put like um, Vaseline or any other sort of like greasy product around the base of the plant. The ants can't walk through it. They won't be able to protect and move the aphids up and down. Uh, so that can be effective for getting rid of the ants or distracting the ants. You're not going to remove the ants from the garden, but it will help prevent them from getting the aphids up and down and stuff. All right, so we have a few questions. I'm going to hop over to that um, before we move on to our last one, which is cutworms. And I want to make sure that I stay on time just to be respectful of everybody's time here tonight. But uh, Let's see, I'll leave the white flies until the end just so I can stay on flow for everybody if they do need to cut out early, Carla, but I will make sure to stay at the end and talk about white flies and how to treat them. Um, all right, so Janoi said, every time I introduce lacewing larvae or eggs, the ants destroy them to protect the aphids. I can't seem to get rid of the aphids, or I'm sorry, the ants, what can I do? Um, so the, for the ants, the sugar water or the, um, the Vaseline or Vicks or whatever um, petroleum like product around the base can help with that um, and give the beneficial insects uh, a chance. But especially with lace wings, everybody always goes for the ladybugs and they, they work for sure. But the lace wings, a lot of times we don't think they're doing anything, but they're there and they are working. 
Um, the nice thing about uh, lace wings too is they're more active at night, which can also be something that we're not noticing as much because we just don't realize that they're working. Um, and the ants are less active at night, so that definitely gives them that window of opportunity. But um, just making sure that the balance is in their favor, so just trying to distract the ants and overloading the system if you are purchasing them, um, it can work. I've seen it um, in my own garden. I had mealy bugs really bad, and I, I did lace wing. I did um, the lace wing eggs um, every uh, three weeks uh, for four, four in a row, and the mealy bugs are pretty much completely gone. So they can work. It's just tipping that balance in their favor. Okay. All right, so, so we'll save Laura the grasshoppers till the end since it wasn't already in the flow of the talk. Um, Rebecca asked about diatomaceous earth for ants and aphids. Diatomaceous earth is very effective if it stays dry. Once it gets wet, it's pretty much ineffective. So I will absolutely use it um, in my chicken coop because it's covered to keep lice and mites and stuff out of the chickens. Um, it can be effective if you're doing like an all natural pest for in, in your house. If you sprinkle diatomaceous earth around the edge um, of your house where there's cracks or anything, it can keep away roaches and ants and all sorts of things. It's very effective, but only if it's dry. Once it gets wet, it's kaput. And in Florida, and even not in Florida, I mean, unless you're using a drip irrigation system, um, that's potentially buried, our soil is going to get wet. So it's a very constant reapplication situation. And I just feel like it's not the best use of resources in the garden. Um, so it is a great product. It's not super effective here in Florida just because of all that moisture, in my opinion. But it, 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 if it's in contact with, so like if you have an aphid problem and you literally just walk up to the plant with your like little pinch of diatomaceous earth and kind of sh you know, fling it on them, that will kill them. But it's not like a, it's not something you can put in place and leave it and expect it to maintain that, that performance, if that makes any sense. All right, so uh, we talked about aphids, and now we're going to talk about our last uh, pest for this evening, which is cutworms. Cutworms are so infuriating because you'll have all your beautiful little seedlings. They're doing wonderfully and you go out the next morning to water them and half of them are little withered stalks on the ground. So the deal with cutworms is that they bury themselves just below the soil surface in the in, uh, underground. We don't see them during day. They're active at night. And what they'll come do is they literally just crawl up and eat the base of the plant. They can only do it on young, tender seedlings. So once the plant is mature, um, they're not able to get through it as much. Um, and it's not typically an issue, but those young ones are especially vulnerable to this issue. Uh, so there are a few different things you can use. The most effective and not uh, very applicable on a large scale, but for home scale gardening can be very effective, is having a collar around those seedling plants. So um, like toilet paper rolls are really common. You just slice the toilet paper roll, wrap it around the seedling, and slightly bury the cardboard into the soil because like I said, they will be slightly underneath the soil. So if you just place it right on top, the cutworm will come out of the soil and into the ring. So you do have to kind of nestle it down into the soil a little bit, uh, but that can be a very effective way to do it. Some people will use like tin foil and stuff, um, also effective. I just think that the cardboard is a little bit easier to apply um, because you don't want to actually trap moisture or anything. So you would have to, with the, the tin foil, you don't want to like actually put it tight to the plant. Another effective way to do it is, especially if you noticed it happening, uh, and it only got a couple of your plants, go out the next night with a flashlight and look for them. Um, they're active at night, so they'll probably be cruising around on the soil surface or on the plants. So take a look then and hand pick them and remove them from the garden, drop them in a soapy bucket, squish them, or uh, re relocate them to somewhere else in your yard that isn't um, so valuable to you. You can put coffee grounds in eggshells. Uh, I've seen mixed results. Uh, I don't know if it's a matter of how much you apply, 
uh, but the rough texture, um, sharp edges, again, the diatomaceous earth could technically work in this scenario, especially if you're doing seedlings where you've got them watering from the bottom of the tray and you're not having to um, water from the top. The diatomaceous earth could potentially last through until you're transplanting them into the garden. Uh, and they also feed on dead plant material. So when the uh, seedlings aren't around with that nice young tender growth, they're looking at for stuff that's already partially decayed. So keeping the garden a little bit tidier, especially when you've got new seedlings in the area can help eliminate basically an alternative food source for them. Um, the last result, uh, result or resort, um, in my opinion, would be BT. And it's a spray uh, Basilicus thurogenesis, and it's um, a bacteria that comes in a spray form. I think there's also a powder form. I've only, always only used a spray form. Uh, you apply it, it gets, uh, they eat it, they ingest it, and it can um, mess up their reproductive system and kill them. So it is not effective quickly. It is an effective long-term solution by having that bacteria in the environment and the soil. So don't expect to, um, if you're having a massive problem and you get BT spray, don't expect immediate results. It's, like I said, it's a, it's a longer process with that, but it is very effective. Um, and it's almost like having beneficial insects in the garden, right? So if we have this in, in the soil and the bacteria is present normally, um, in our in our garden and everything like that, uh, it can kind of help stabilize and keep things in balance. So we have a few questions. Um, so the cutworms, Lori, are in this picture. They're usually a darker blackish brown. They have stripes that are fatter than most of like your typical caterpillars, like the little tiny like green cabbage loppers and stuff. They almost look like grubs um, to most people. They've got a harder head uh, and they all, not always, but a lot of times when you pick them up, they're gonna curl into like a little ball, into a little C shape. Um, so that's kind of indicative of the cupworms as well. Um, but they do look a lot like other larvae. Um, so Kat asked if neem is um, helpful for aphids in particular, but any pest really. I use neem very, very, very rarely. Um, it is said that it doesn't affect beneficial insects like uh, pollinator species and stuff. I, I try to use things I understand the process on. And to me, I struggle with the concept that it can affect. So basically what neem does is it disrupts the hormone and endocrine system in the insects. So it affects them, their eating, it affects their reproduction. It does not actually kill them on contact. It is not like a, a pesticide where like you, you apply it and they die. It is a long-term solution, like a life cycle disruption basically. And it's supposed to not be harmful to the beneficials, but if it can affect a caterpillar or it can affect an aphid or whatever else the case may be, I just, I don't understand and I've, I've researched and I haven't found any uh, um, like research or logic behind it, but like how can it affect bad guys and not good guys if that's the process that it's affecting, the, the hormone system and everything. Like the, the Basilicus, um, the BT, it's a bacteria that is very specific to caterpillars um, and it's only affecting their digestive system and it's not harmful and they've proven it and it's not harmful to the others. So like that makes more sense to me. It's a very like specific relationship that those two, two insects or well bacteria and insect have with each other. But with the neem, it seems so much more broad that I just, it just doesn't sit well with me. So I don't personally use neem very often. It's, it's um, a very last resort for me, um, but that is just my personal opinion. Uh, and there are a ton of, it is certified organic and there are a ton of people who do use it. All right, so we are going to go to our last slides so that we can make sure we end on time if anybody needs to cut out. I don't wanna go over, but I will stay to answer questions. So uh, I did say that I would have the pest deterrent spray recipe for you all. 
here it is. This is the one I use. There are about a bazillion different variations thereof, but this is what I typically have used in my garden. I always like to grow at a bare minimum a hot pepper plant. They are absolutely prolific here. I am not like a hot sauce on everything kind of girl. I use hot peppers very sparingly, but I always have at least one plant planted because I use it for my deterrent spray. Um, so we're talking about the hot, hot, hot peppers, like a ghost pepper or um, any, like even a habanero. We're talking about the stuff that you don't really want to consume a lot of. The hotter, the better. Uh, so you want to have five to 10 of those. You can purchase them. You don't have to grow them yourself, but they are very easy to grow in Florida. So if you just have one bush, it's usually more than sufficient to suit your, your needs, especially if you're just using it for the spray. Um, and then a whole head of garlic. And basically what you're going to do is just, you don't have to um, cut it up real fine or anything, just rough chop it just enough to get the, the flesh of the garlic and the peppers exposed. And you're going to put that into water. There are two ways you can do this. Um, some people will put it into the water and boil it. If you do this inside, do be aware that the oils are very aromatic and it can make you cough um, and it can get to you. So if you have a grill or something like that where you could do it outdoor or one of those um, portable like a uh, propane burners, that would be ideal. Instead of doing that, if you only have like a stove top or whatnot and you don't want to deal with that, um, that the, it getting into the air, you can just let it sit overnight. Um, and I usually will still let it sit overnight after I cook it just for I don't know, added measure. I usually will stick it in the fridge overnight and then blend it up the next day. Um, so you're going to either boil it or just let it soak overnight. Um, if you do just let it soak overnight, I would suggest trying to chop it a little bit finer just to expose as much of that flesh since it's not going through that cooking process. Um, and then the next, uh, you'll blend it. And so then any of the solids or the pulp that's left, even after blending, you'll want to strain out. Otherwise, that will clog your spray bottle. And you simply pour it into the spray bottle with a few drops of dish soap. Um, it can be whatever dish soap you have using. People ask me, does it have to be organic? Is it Dawn? Whatever, whatever you have in your house is going to work just fine. Basically, all of that is doing is so soap helps emulsify or mix oil and water. That is how soap helps us clean dishes is it allows water and oil to bind. That's what the soap is doing. So when we put it into our, our, our pepper spray and water spray, those two would naturally not mix well. And we want it to be throughout the entire mixture to be able to spray on all the plants. So when we put the soap in there, it helps mix the two. So you just shake it up, spray it on the plant, and there is your pest deterrent spray. So that can be a really cheap, easy way to get rid of these garden pests. So um, that will be the end of tonight's talk and I will stay to answer those last few questions that we had or anything else that does pop up. Um, but just to give anybody, if we're not already, um, if you're not already part of my community and everything like that, I do have um, a lot of different resources available for people, daily gardening tips weekly, maybe not right now because I've been a little overwhelmed with balancing uh, childcare and, and my business, um, but I normally weekly videos, right now they're probably every other week, um, on Florida-based vegetable gardening, uh, beginner vegetable gardening tips, tricks, tutorials. I also have a monthly garden newsletter, it's free. You go to my website, theurbanharvest.com, sign up for the newsletter, and I will send out a monthly update that talks about what seeds to plant, um, timely videos, if there's like a, a pest problem that's in that time of year, if there's a certain thing crop that everybody's harvesting, I'll usually have a video, I have upcoming events, that kind of thing. Um, and when you subscribe, that also gets you the free what to plant when cheat sheet that I offer. Um, so that's definitely available. I also do uh, at least two to four classes a month, um, typically online, at least lately, uh, but sometimes in person as well. I'm hoping to get started with the in-person in November. Uh, so definitely look at the event calendar for that coming up if you're local. I also have a vegetable seed club, um, which actually many of the attendees uh, tonight are in. Uh, and that mails three varieties of in-season seed to your door each month. Um, so with seed success cards on how to grow them, and it's a, it's a good way to get into the gardening scene. I do also do virtual and in-home consultations as well. So I am here to try to help as many people grow their food as possible. So I am here 
for you. If you have questions or anything like that, do please reach out to me uh, if there's a way I can assist. I am always, always happy to help. With that being said, if anybody needs to hop off, I, I totally understand if you'd like to hang out um, and listen to some of these last few questions, uh, feel free to do that as well. And remember the recording will get sent out to everybody uh, by tomorrow. Uh, and it will also include the integrative pest management video that I mentioned uh, so that you can further research that as well. All right, so um, we have, let's see here. We had the white fly question. So white flies are pretty common here. They are small flying insects. They create um, a, like a, a soot on top of the leaves. It can definitely affect the plant growth and affect yields. It can kill a plant. Uh, soapy water is effective um, for treating white flies. You can also use sticky traps. Um, and you can also do um, neem if you really must. A lot of people will use that for white flies. You can also, if you have like a shop vac or anything like that, you can literally just vacuum them off um, the plant. So that is also another remedy that is very targeted and not like residual like the neem is. So those are all options for dealing with white flies. Um, the, Laura asked about the ginormous yellow grasshoppers. Those are the lubbers. They are toxic, which is why they are so prevalent here and don't have very many predators. Um, that yellow and red indicates to potential predators that they should not be eaten. I remember when I was just starting out in the organic aspect of things and I got my first chickens and I threw one of those in there and they just looked at me like, you're trying to kill us? Like, I'm not eating that. They like, normally would eat anything I toss in there and they knew better. Um, so those guys are toxic. So there's not a lot of natural predators in the environment. Um, I, even though we talked about all of these management approaches, I've gotten to the point now where I'm fairly hands off in my garden. I really very minimally use a lot of these action approaches and just try to continually help balance that relationship that we were talking about with nature with like the natural predators, making sure the plants are healthy. Um, but with that being said, this is one that I usually, um, if they're on valuable or sensitive plants where I know they would be able to eat the whole thing, um, I will uh, eliminate them by just cutting them with loppers. Um, so you can use like garden clippers or whatnot and just cut them in half or squash them. You can potentially put them in soapy water as well. Um, but those, those guys um, are not going to be deterred by very many of the techniques that we talked about today. So um, usually hand picking, um, luckily when they're small and they're black with that yellow stripe, uh, they're more of a, especially once they're big, they're very easy to spot. So you can just kind of hand pick and deal with them um, individually. All right, so, um, Ms. Jacobson asked, how do insecticidal soaps work? So the insecticidal soaps, um, if you're looking for a direct application, the, the soap will actually clog the, so insects breathe through their entire carapace. So they're not like us where they need their mouth and their nose. They basically essentially breathe through their skin. Um, so when you apply a soap directly to them, it will clog those pores. They can't breathe and they die. That's how, how it works. Um, and then as far as you will also typically see um, soap in a lot of other recipes like the, the pest repellent recipe. And in those scenarios, it is for the emulsifying effect with the oil and the water. So it's kind of a twofold use in a lot of the common um, pesticides that you'll see or repellents. All right, Karen asked, do you use um, the spray at night or can you use spray anytime during the day? Very good point. Uh, I totally forgot to cover that and that is an important aspect of using any sort of oil-based spray, whether it be neem or the hot pepper garlic spray or any of those insecticidal sprays you can purchase over the counter. Uh, it is always ideal to do them um, very early morning or late at night um, after the sun has set because 
uh, oil on the plants can absolutely magnify the sun and burn your plants. So that is a very important aspect. Um, so either night or very early morning where the oil has time to basically dry and absorb onto the plant. All right, Carla said she's having issues with snails too. I'm not sure if they're harming this plants or not. They can. Snails are not usually as big of an issue here. Um, slugs can sometimes be an issue. Uh, if you've noticed that there are a ton of trails on your plants where it's almost like they've been scraped in little lines up your plants, um, they can be affecting it. If they're really bad, it could potentially take out a plant. They don't like eggshells, like we were talking about with the cutworms, the coffee grounds or the eggshells sprinkled around your plants can be helpful. Um, you can also do a dish of beer next to it. They're attracted to it um, and they'll basically drown. Uh, so instead of like the sugar water for the ants, you can do a little beer dish for your snails. Uh, hand picking also, and they like moisture. Um, and surfaces to hide under during the day, it gets too hot. So like if you have like a lot of pebbles or rocks in and around your garden area, that gives them a, a hiding place, a moist hiding place during the day. So eliminating that could help as well. All right, so I think we've rolled through everybody's questions. So I will wrap up our talk for tonight. Um, like I said, I'll be sending out the recording and um, getting that out to everybody soon. So thank you very much for coming to the talk tonight. Um, and I will hopefully run into you or hear from you or see you again at one of the future talks. Have a great night.